and I'm going to make a start. Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to Co Expo 2022. We have an inspiring schedule ahead of us this year. Today is all about sustainable materials, latest innovation and best practice, and learning from the suppliers and brands that are leading the way. In our first session, The Leading Edge, we focus on new and emerging opportunities when it comes to sustainable sourcing, how they can make a difference, and where to start to integrate them into your collection. We're going to hear from inspiring speakers, then some of the suppliers that are making waves on Common Objective. We launched Common Objective in 2018 with the goal of creating a community for a change and a race to the top. As well as matching our members to partner in their shared common objective, that is great fashion business that values people and planet, every business on Co has a sustainability waiting. So you can create a business profile free of charge. And the more sustainable your business, the higher its search ranking, the more views and visits on its profile. And we do see that our highest ranking businesses get over 2,700% more views than the others. So it's working. We want to create to a race to the top where sustainability becomes an opportunity and not a cost. And as part of this, we run the Co Leadership Awards and we're pleased to announce the Co 10 winners just yesterday. Um, many of you will meet some of those over the week. We're gonna be showcasing some of the suppliers, five suppliers won the Co 10. We had 130 winners across the Leadership Awards. So you'll meet those and connect with them this week. Before I move on to the speakers, I wanted to share our solidarity with Ukraine. Like so many others in our community, we've been floored by the horror of the events in Ukraine. And we want to use the unity of CoExpo to share initiatives that are supporting the people of Ukraine. So if you have ideas and you're doing things and you have ways that this community can support the people who are surviving in horrendous conditions, please share them in the chat. We'll promote them to our broader network. So moving on to the speakers, we have three awesome speakers joining us at the beginning of this session, as well as hearing from other speakers throughout the rest of the, the hour. Um, uh, we're going to hear from Tiffany Chen, who's the founder of Textile Solutions, an expert across a broad area of innovative fabrics. Anna, uh, Anurag Gupta, who's the managing director of Ashi Yarns, who's partnering with this session. And thanks to him, we've been able to bring this to you. And Enrica Arena, who's CEO of Orange Fiber, one of the most innovative new fibers coming out today. So I would like to start with you, Tiffany. Um, welcome. Great to have you in the space. And my first question to you, which new and innovative materials are exciting you right now and why? Hi, Tenzin. Hi, everyone. Hi. Nice to see you online and thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting one. And I have to say, as a uh, founder of a marketplace working really at the juncture with many innovators. Uh, it's a tough question because there are so many innovative material, but if I really have to choose and share something today, I would say it's the biofabricated material. Um, reason being they are really the technology that's being used to create these fibers are just mind boggling, ground, groundbreaking, and also creates a lot of new potential. And maybe I'll highlight um, two specific ma materials that are also coming into the market, hopefully um, very soon, really a commercial stage. One uh, would be uh, Protein Silk. So actually two companies are very close to actually bring this to commercial stage. One is from Bowthread and they call the material Microsilk and the other one is from Spiber and the material itself is called Spiber. Maybe some of you have heard of it, maybe some not, but essentially what this is, um, it's a protein developed through a bioengineering process that put genetics into yeast and then they mass produce these proteins through a fermentation process. And then they isolate and purify the proteins and spin them into yarn. And they can actually engineer the yarn so that it either has like silk-like texture or cashmere-like texture or has insulation properties. So this is one category. Um, the other one is mycelium. 
which I'm sure this has been in the press a lot. So probably a lot of you also um, are familiar with it. Essentially, for those who don't know, essentially mycelium, uh, their cells, and two companies are doing this also at, at scale. Again, both three is one of them, and then there's Microworks. Um, and what they do, they basically take these mycelium cells, uh, which are similar in what we find in mushroom. They put these on beds of renewable or organic matter um, and grow them in often like vertical farms. So then it also reduces the land use. And once it's grown and they can also engineer the texture, the weight, the shape of these materials. So um, very, very interesting and exciting. And once it's grown, they then have the option to then tan or dye it or leave it as natural. So I, I would say these are the two most exciting uh, area of material technology innovation. You've talked about the building blocks of reinventing the, reinventing the material building blocks, the conventional way that we produce and consume materials. How does that change with some of these new technologies? I think it really changes from the ground up. If we talk about a conventional material such as cotton, of course, you first grow the cotton on the farm that is water intensive, chemical usage heavy, and then you have to then transfer the, transform the the cotton into fiber, spin them into yarn, etc. So with these microfabricated material, they are essentially re-engineering the, the whole production process. You know, the mushroom I, I mentioned, just from the bioengineering process, they can already um, change and determine the structure, the texture, the, the softness, etc. And um, with yarn, as, as mentioned before as well, just from the same process, but by tweaking different elements, um, they can create different texture, you know, like even um, somehow you don't, to some extent, you don't need different kind of machine uh, to, to uh, produce different texture yarn. And then something I didn't mention before, but also coming into the market um, is the algae uh, material. So like sea cell and one quite interesting one, uh, again, these are biofabricated. Uh, they take algae in the lab and again, through the biofabricating um, process already determine the color. So entirely skipping the color dye process. So really, I think the possibility is, is enormous. And also what's important to highlight um, in this um, process of growing and biofabricating the, the fiber, they need feedstock, which is similar to you know, growing cotton, et cetera. But uh, what's interesting is that um, with these technology, they actually have a wide range of feedstock um, currently, yes, they do use some plant-based uh, feedstock, but actually what's also possible is using food waste as feedstock or even using greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide or methane as feedstock. So essentially in the process of put inputting um, to grow these fibers, they're actually sequestering carbon. So that's pretty cool. So in a way, the processes phase out a lot of the challenges with conventional materials. Correct. Like you in talked about the pressure and the competition for land use. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so the opportunity is to scale these up. Um, I mean, you talked about what? So we've got a room full of professionals, designers, uh, pra practitioners in the fashion industry. If they're interested in integrating some of these new materials, where, where should they start? I think by learning about it, it's already a great start because... Um, having said that, uh, some of these materials, depending on which material we're talking about, uh, some are biodegradable, some are not, uh, some are circular ready, some are not. So I think first learning about these material is already a key point. And in terms of how to get access to these material, um, of course, scaling uh, requires a lot of capital, uh, requires a lot of orders. So typically these material companies um, start off by partnering with you know, larger brands who has the volume, who also can do broad scale testing. And then once it's tested, reiterated, then obviously the end goal is for these companies to make their products available to everyone. Uh, so, I mean, one is to understand or the second is of, of course, be on the lookout for when these products come into the market. And what I would also highlight, 
there are obviously sometimes caveats when these very new innovative material come into the market. So they might have some limitation. And maybe a good place to start is by designing these, using these material in a capsule collection. Maybe just in small quantity, maybe to test it out, but you're not subject to you know, extensive testing or needing to secure a large volume of this material in order to launch a production. I think by designing it in a capsule already give the brand much more flexibility and maybe even higher budget because typically these materials are higher cost to start with. So that's what I would suggest. And through content on Co, we will be looking to put the spotlight on some examples and we're all about avoiding reinventing the wheel. So many people are doing this. There are ways that you can, steps that you can take to integrate it. One other thing I wanted to raise with you before we move on, Tiffany, and that's the side of um, biofabrics and new innovation that we don't all, always hear about. We don't often hear about it. It's sometimes not raised. And that's the social impact. So we know that there is a positive social impact uh, for many types of production. If done well, it supports thousands in communities. It can create fulfilling work. What does it mean for biofabric now if we're to move if we're to scale up this model how can we do that in a way that is three-dimensional that supports the people too and this might be a question to all the other panelists too as we move in because it's not an easy one to answer <laughs> thank you for throwing out a difficult question but I think it's a very important one because in the end even if it's material we are not just talking about environmental impact social impact is absolutely a huge one um, I think it's important to also differentiate between different category of materials. So thank, not thankfully, but typically now, if we already look at the conventional material um, in the factory, already not a lot of uh, human employees are involved. Typically you see more employees at the garment factory level. However, leather, for example, is obviously already more human, um, men capital intensive with the tanning process. So I think it's really important that we recognize there will be an impact and also do something about these impacts. So whether it's the supplier themselves thinking, okay, how do we already, I think raising awareness is the first, first step because obviously, you know, these people working in the tanneries in different countries to all of a sudden upskill them or relocate them into a different job is not possible. It, it, it will be a process that takes time, but I think this awareness and commitment from the suppliers and even the brands um, is an important step that we need to take. Thank you so much. Um, so Tiffany, are you going to be here until the end of the session if people have questions? So yes, please post your questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, it's an advantage to have somebody like Tiffany in the room who has answers to a lot of the questions you may have. And I would like to now move on to Anurag Gupta. Welcome, Managing Director of Usher Yarns, a really inspiring company that is scaling up recycling. Uh, Anurag, would you like to say a few words, tell me a little bit about what the main advantages are of recycled yarn from a sustainability perspective. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Thompson, and okay. hello, everyone. We've been do doing recycling for almost 15 years, 20 years now. And uh, recycling is something I think it is comes naturally to humans. The way we live, the way we work, recycling, without recycling, we'll run out of resources. So I believe anything that we do today, ultimately, the way the world is progressing economically, the whole of the world is consuming more and more. If we cannot bring recycling into our system, it's not sustainable. And recycling helps you to reduce the consumption, the pressure on virgin resources. At the case of our product, cotton recycling, you don't have to grow that much cotton. It will reduce the consumption of water. It will reduce the consumption of pesticides. So the pressure on the system comes down drastically. I think whatever we do, we must uh, recycle. That is something you cannot avoid. You don't have to die. Like in our case, uh, the, the material that we recycle is already colored. So once we recycle it mechanically and make it again into a yarn, you don't have to dye it. 
So again, you are reducing the pressure on the environment in terms of pollution, in terms of dye consumption, in terms of production of those dyes that may be required to diverge in resources. So recycling is something which has been a part of human life for ever since humanity and it has to be a part. If we avoid it, then we'll come back to it. And you're doing some really interesting things to move the shift the paradigm when it comes to recycling. What new opportunities would you say are emerging? Um, in recycling, when I come to the textile industry, polyester recycling has been around for a couple of years and the industry has more or less matured and today it is almost de rigueur to use recycled polyester fiber from pet bottles or uh, ocean waste or fishing nets. Cotton recycling was something which uh, was there for a long time and it was being done, but the applications were mainly at a very coarse or a low value level going into padding or some home textiles or maybe socks. So over the years, we've been trying to work around it and I wouldn't say we've invented something, but we've uh, controlled the processes to a level where the yarn that we produce from recycled cotton can go back to making a garment. So the t-shirt cutting, the post-industrial waste is recycled back again into a t-shirt and uh, you have a new one, which is good enough. And you don't have to dye, you don't have to use virgin cotton. And uh, that means that a lot of brands today, we've improved the quality to a level that we assure the brand in terms of whatever uh, uh, fears they had in their mind to the consistency, to the compliances, chemical compliances, to uh, the color consistency. And today, several brands have already accepted this as a regular material on their shelves. Uh, garments made out of uh, recycled yarns. This was not the case until a few years ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've seen and we've seen some movement when it comes to the costs. So you've you've been able. Do you want to talk to I us? Mean, a bit? Yes, of course. The cost is much lesser. You we will sell a colored yarn at the price of a. Uh, color, a gray yarn as we call it in cotton and uh, so you save money also but uh, more than the money it is the environmental impact of what we do what we make uh, which we actually advertise uh, and of course whoever does it will end up saving some money also the whole of the dying cost is saved so finally, your, your recommendations for people in this room for in relation to using recycled yarn or in relation to recycling in general, what are, you, what are your top tips? You've worked with a lot of businesses oh, and well, seen yes. them integrate yeah. recycling when they ha didn't have any before in, in the first place. Yeah, what, what, do, what are your tips? Till now, we are recycling 100% cotton t-shirt and it's a bit difficult to handle blends into quality products. So I think what I have always been promoting or I always want to happen to further the cause of recycling, to further the cause of uh, reduction of uh, impact of uh, pollution on the environment and the textile industry is uh, infamous for a huge contribution to pollution of the environment is that when we design things like mono material, designing a garment to recycling, that can really lend to recycling of more and more production waste and even post-consumer. Today, at even today, the post-consumer recycling, we hear a lot of money going into it, a lot of research going into it, things like chemical recycling, chemical extraction from blends, and, uh, but uh, I believe that of course is welcome because it will probably create a whole new paradigm. But to uh, mechanical recycling has proven itself to be one of the 
cheapest, one of the least environmental impact systems for recycling. And if we can actually design garments, whether it is mono material or the sewing to facilitate recycling, which I would coin a term ease of recycling. Mm -hmm can actually promote ease of recycling as an important factor, just as you write hazardous for health on a packet of cigarettes. So if you can start mentioning ease of recycling, how easily you can grade it, how easily a product can be recycled, that can affect a lot of buying decisions, that can affect a lot of branding, and that can really lead to a huge movement towards recycling and reduction of uh, uh, the, the impact on the environment. Thank you. So much more that I'd like to hear from you, but we're slightly over time. So thank you so much. And again, if anyone has questions, if they'd like to consider um, recycling or learn more from Asha, please post it in the chat. You can connect with everybody in this session on Co. You can message them. And to make things easier, we've created a hub, uh, a sourcing hub, if one of the team might put the link in for today, where you can find all the exhibitors that we're hearing from today and you can connect with them directly. And I'd like to now move on to Enrica um, from Orange Fiber. Thank you so much for joining us, Enrique. Thank, I know you've been you. busy. Thank, thank, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anurag. Thank you for, for your time and for your support of this session. Um, so, Enrique, yes, thank you for joining us. Um, I know you've been much in demand um, because of your, your fiber, and there's a lot of interest around it. So, could you start by telling us what is orange fiber and how is it made? Yeah, for sure. So Thank you for having me and also thank you to the other speaker because I think they, they were great. So our um, technology allows us to extract uh, cellulose that can be used to make lyocell from citrus byproducts. So from the leftovers of the juice industry. So basically we work in Sicily, in Italy to do so. So we take the byproducts from the juice industry and we transform it into a cellulose. And then we partner with a, a number of players in the supply chain to make fibers, yarn and fabrics that we sell directly to fashion brands. Thank you. And can you share what's exciting about Orange Fiber? So how will it change things, both for brands in the way they communicate and talk about what they do and integrate sustainability, but also for the environment? I think what is super exciting for me in working with this company and actually leading it since now uh, eight years, it has been seeing uh, how sustainability has shifted in, in the meanwhile and how we can uh, transfer more and more value to the brands who decide to use uh, orange fiber. So in this, um, in this uh, picture that you have displayed right now, you will see some foulard that have been made by uh, Marinella, who is a tie maker, very famous in Italy, that has developed a line uh, with our uh, material. So for us, giving existing brands that are trying to better and easily communicate their um, involvement and their commitment in sustainability, through uh, our material and through our communication and trademark is really a privilege. And I think this is what is most exciting for them as well, because through the use of our fiber and yarns, they also um, enlighten and find more uh, and provide more information about their unique supply chain. So we use it as a tool for transparency and for uh, giving more and more information to the final client on sustainability, not just on the material, but also on all the people and technology involved. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question, and then I, I, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat for you. So I'm going to have to leave you to answer those in the chat, if you don't mind, because we're running slightly short on time. If we can raise some at the end, we will. Um, but my, my last question for you is your top three recommendations 
for professionals and brands considering using orange fiber? Well, I think uh, what, one thing we are trying to push is really um, having patience because it's not like a normal uh, supplier client relationship, but what we are trying to create is really a relationship with the brands that is uh, finalized, not just to sell fibers, but to find and build together a product that, that stays on the market that is that, that can be communicated as sustainable. So the work with us is really to build uh, a capsule collection, but that has sustainability, not just in the material, but really in each and every single aspect. So our recommendation is really to uh, work with us to start this process towards sustainability or enhance it if you're already on it and really design for sustainability in mind, not just for, from the raw material, but also for the use phase and for the end of life phase of your clients. Thank you so much. We'll try and capture that in our uh, follow up from this event so that people have it. But uh, yeah, just to remind you again, please do answer those questions in the chat and in the Q&A. Thanks so much for your time. I'm slightly over time. So we're going to move on to Andy, who's going to introduce some of the other suppliers. Now, to tell you how it works, we put the spotlight on a small number of featured suppliers in these sessions. We can't tell you about everybody on Co, um, but we do select those in line with our leadership criteria, businesses, suppliers need to meet certain standards to be represented at Co. Um, and we have featured exhibitors and we also have supporting exhibitors. You can find all of those in the hub. Um, so I'll, with that further ado, I'll pass over to you, Andy. Thank you so much, uh, Tamsin and, and the, those guys who've just spoken, Tiffany, Anna Ragan, and Enrique, super, super interesting. Uh, we're going to move on now uh, to a few other businesses who are also super, super interesting and exciting. And I'm really excited that we can introduce them to you. Um, some you may have heard of, some you may not have heard of. So without further ado, we're going to hand over to Fortify. Uh, and Stan is going to share more uh, in, in two minutes, share more about uh, their USP uh, to us now. Thank you, Stan. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Lord. Uh, actually, Laura will, will, will do the presentations uh, for the two minutes. So I will show some uh, product along the way when she's talking. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> okay. So, hi, I'm Laura. Um, so, one of the unique things Fortify provides is recycled and fabric. Uh, we have a biohacking approach that utilizes organic waste from fabrics as well as plant and fruit waste to reproduce biopolymers that can be spun into biodegradable and recyclable fabric. Two examples of biodegradable fabrics are PLA and PHPV, which are made from waste corn product. In keeping with the biodegradable model, Fortify specializes in plant-based fabric treatments which can be applied pre or post production. These treatments add properties such as anti wrinkle, stain repellent, sweat wicking, and more. These fabrics, or sorry, these formulas are all biodegradable, preserving the end of life usability of the garment. When used in combination with natural fibers, this creates a 100% biodegradable garment. When the strength and resilience of synthetic fibers is required, we rely on recycling as the most responsible approach. We are currently working on a closed loop system where garments at the end of their life can be recycled and spun back into new fabric or garments using our proprietary organic solution. The garment is shredded and then dissolved into liquid fiber, which is spun out into new fiber, forming fabric and whole garments. The resulting fabric and garments have the construction of micro to nano sized fibers, which creates the added value of antimicrobial, a moisture wicking, odor and stain free results, along with flexibility and softness. An example of this application is recycled nylon swimwear, which can be infinitely recycled back into new swimwear. Another end recycled Another end product of this is recycled polyester organza, which we've seen designers use in evening wear collections. And I believe Stan has some swatches 
of this to show. Sorry, yeah. So basically, uh, as Lawrence mentioned, uh, we, we work on some recycling and biodegradable because we like to focus on sustainable and close loop fashions. And we, we look at how we can actually do this in a more modular, modular way. It means that you can actually have like your waste garment that you can spread and then dissolve them at the same spot and then try to spin them into more of fabrics or even final shape garments such as this, something like accessory or small items that you can be a kind of garment. So it's basically like the movie Spider-Man where they are making the whole spider suit using some raw material that we can keep on recycling. And we feel that in this way, you can like do small collections, like what just uh, Tiffany just mentioned just now. And you, you, of course, cost is one thing, but it shows that the potentials that you can do that. And then doing recycling material like polyesters and nylons, we also try uh, with Stan, the- uh, so, Stan, so, sorry to interrupt. The sound seems to be getting worse <laughs> rather than better. Um, the sound seems to be getting worse rather than better. Uh, so, but thank you for showing some of those on screen. Laura, is there anything else you quickly wanted to add? To um, no, that's about it. So as he was showing right now, we're in a small scale production because of the size of our operations, but we are looking to expand into, you know, larger whole garments. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Stan and Laura. Uh, we're moving on now to Dimpora. Um, all of these businesses, uh, you can connect with them. You can connect with Stan and Laura through the link in the chat. Um, we're putting every business profile uh, here into the chat to make it easy for any of you to contact them. Um, so as we move on to Dimpora, um, Nina is going to be sharing more uh, about what they do. Over to you, Nina. Exactly. Hello, everyone. So um, as you can see on the slides, Dimpora um, is also in the polymer space. Um, we are producing microporous membranes, which are waterproof and breathable for the application, mostly actually in outerwear garments. So in rain jackets, ski jackets, anything that needs to be waterproof and breathable at the same time. Um, what makes Dimpora special? So I think there are three main area which um, we are good in. The first one would be the performance. Second one would be sustainability and the third one, the versati um, versatility. So in terms of performance, we are able to achieve very high breathability due to the micropore structure of our membranes. And also on the other hand, um, our pore coating technology allows us to create good waterproofing at the same time. In terms of sustainability, our first selling point is definitely that all our membranes are free of fluorinated chemicals and also any other type of bioaccumulative toxins. And then also um, we are able to produce membranes in a solvent-free production process, and this from a large variety of base polymers. This um, versatility in terms of raw materials also allows us to produce monomaterial laminates and also garments in the end, of course, as well as bio-based um, and or biodegradable materials. Currently we are working on the scale up of a polyolivin membrane and also on a compostable polyester membrane. You can see a sample here. I don't know how well it shows, but this is more or less how a membrane looks like. Then in terms of versatility, all our membranes have some intrinsic elasticity, and this is due to our special pore forming technology. This makes them very well suited for sports gear in which people have to move a lot, you can imagine. Here I brought a three layer laminate with an orange outer fabric um, and a black backer. And I hope you can see um, it's quite stretchy for a membrane. Um, yeah. And then also um, as a last point, we are able to work on um, a 3D model. So we are developing the 3D membrane technology, which um, we can use to apply a microporous membrane directly on a 3D garment by either spraying, dip coating, or also painting. And this then in the end allows us to avoid seams and the use of seam tapes. Okay, I guess I'm almost at the end of my two minutes. So if you are interested in Impora and you would like to hear more about, then we would be very happy to connect and um, yeah, present you what we can offer. That's amazing. Thank you, Nina. Um, there's a lot of really good questions popping into the chat. Uh, so do encourage people. Uh, we'll have some time at the end 
of this session for a, a Q&A, but I don't think we're going to have a lot of time. So uh, I don't want these questions getting lost. So do connect with, with the speakers here um, and ask them directly your questions if we don't reach them. Um, and also any of you in the room, um, any of you who are exhibiting or speaking, um, please do keep, keep replying to those messages in the chat because there's some really good questions coming through. Um, we move on now to Nord Shield uh, and Emmy is in the room. Uh, and she's going to share more about uh, about Nordshield. Yes, I'm delighted to. Thank you for inviting us. Our ability and the potential scale of the po positive impact across industries, including the textile and fashion industries, is quite significant. Since by replacing heavy metals and harmful chemicals in antimicrobial treatments, as they are used today widely, through our wood extract based technology, our biotechnology can really benefit both the, um, all of them, the environment, factory workers, consumers, and also corporate brands by offering a safer and more sustainable, but yet just as powerful solution. And our technology has already been commercialized in two applications. So one of them being an antimicrobial textile treatment that is used seamlessly in the manufacturing process, so at, at the textile mill directly. And then there's ready to use disinfectants for increased hygiene and also odor control. Um, and they have the enhanced performance through the Nordgeal technology. The raw, material, the, the raw materials for a disruptive and patent pending technology are basically limitlessly available. And since the production of it is unbound to ge geography, we can really serve both local and global customers at scale. And at Nordshield, we do not believe in just working for a better tomorrow, but we actually believe that we all must work for the best tomorrow. And it's delightful that I think we all share it in, in this room, this, this view, uh, since we, we do believe that anything else would not be enough. So if you would be interested in the, the Nordshield technology and potentially applying it into your products, I have also my colleague Janne Hakonen, our head of sales, who is on this call and uh, is also on the CEO platform. So he would be then also very happy to arrange a meeting and, and tell more about the Norgeal technology. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Brilliant. Really, really great. Uh, we move on now to Piratex uh, and Pillar is in the room. Delighted to, to hear from you now, Pillar. Hi, good afternoon. <laughs> Okay, well, so um, as many of you might already know, currently 85% of microplastics in our oceans actually come from the synthetic textiles that we wear, such as polyester. Um, not only do they end up polluting our oceans when they're washed, but they, they take forever to biodegrade on land. So 500 years, for example, for a pair of polyester leggings. Um, for this reason, we created Pyrotex fabrics. So we we saw there weren't any functional fabrics in the market that were sustainable. They were all synthetic, which of course are much worse for our planet, but also for our bodies. So actually the textile industry keeps producing and using fabrics that are incapable of biodegrading, that release microplastics when washed, and that will remain on our planet long after we're gone. Uh, so brands are now being forced to address this environmental impact and abandon old, old practices. Uh, by the end consumer, but also by environmental laws like the Paris Agreement or the Environmental Responsibility Act. Fashion groups actually are now so big that it's becoming even harder for them to keep track of all the steps involved in their production, let alone completely control the impact that they have. So for this, uh, they have established goals like banning all virgin synthetics from their collections in 2030. However, the traditional suppliers are not offering sustainable solutions until now. So Paratex fabrics are the natural functional fabrics to replace synthetic textiles in fashion. It's a scalable solution that brands need to transform into the agents of change that we all need them to be. So we're a textile R&D company, we're a textile supplier, and we offer brands such as Fiorucci, Camper, or Pepe Jeans, uh, amongst many others, functional fabrics made with innovative natural fibers that are better for the planet and also better for our bodies. So here, for example, this fabric I'm holding uh, is one of our Paratex cosmetic fabrics. It's made of organic cotton and seaweed. 
which is actually a regenerative fiber harvested in the Northern Atlantic Ocean. Compared to a regular cotton fabric, its production has saved five kilos of CO2 and 700 liters of water. Um, but it also protects the wearer from UV rays and works as an antibacterial barrier. Uh, so if you too want to join the textile evolution, you can contact us directly through our common objective profile. We're always looking forward to new collaborations and, uh, and hopefully we can do nice projects together. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Pilar. Please do reach out to Pilar, get in touch with her. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's brilliant. We'll move on now to uh, Renew Cell. Um, and we've got Nora in the room who is going to share some more. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having us. Um, so Renew Cell, we're a Swedish textile recycling company producing a material uh, for closing the loop on fashion uh, by bringing in textile waste and recycling the cellulose into a dissolving pulp, uh, which is then sold to fiber producers. This is the pulp um, and made into uh, viscose fibers. And I'd say that um, the most unique thing about us and the technology is, is two things. And the first is the quality. So by, um, by chemically recycling the fibers, we're able to produce a, uh, the same quality and the same pulp are usually made uh, used for viscose fibers, which means that there's no real difference um, in, in the quality and no preference changes needed from designers, from um, uh, consumers and from the market, basically. And the other part is scale. So uh, we all know that the, the fashion industry is facing massive problems um, and, and they're caused by the volumes that we produce. So we need the solutions to be at volume as well and to scale and to be able to scale quickly, um, which is what we do. So we are currently building our next factory, which is uh, starting production this summer. And uh, there we're going to be able to recycle up to 500 million t-shirts a year. So it's really getting to a scale where we can have a real impact and, and sell through the supply chain and, and launch clothes with brands like the one, the jacket I have here behind me, for example. Uh, so anyone interested in, in knowing more, more about Circulos and our material, please reach out and I'm happy to help. Amazing. Thank you, Nora. That's super Thank you. great to see the jacket in the background. Yeah. Uh, and last but very much not least, uh, welcome to Sarmita, who is going to tell us about her business, Studio Sarmita. Hey, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me here. Um, so Studio Sarmita is a design studio based in Frankfurt and Germany, and we are a team of designers that work with uh, different waste streams and byproducts and create functioning and high quality materials. And one of such projects that I want to talk about is pre-loved. It is the material I'm holding in my hands. And pre-loved redefines the textile waste as we know it. So different kinds of textile wastes, for example, mixed blends, uh, post-consumer fibers, and as well as textile waste, fibers that are unfit for spinning, are mixed together with natural binders, which creates this uh, paper-like, leather-like bio-textile. And it comes in different thicknesses, it comes in different colors, and can be used for applications for uh, accessories, such as shoes, bags, and even interior design. We achieve different colors by either mixing um, fibers of different colors together in a very selected way, which creates beautiful and marble-like patterns. But it's also possible to use natural dyes for which we have created actually a unique dyeing method where the natural dyes are implemented in the binders itself. And this way we can save a lot of water while already producing the material. But the true superpower of this material is that it is designed more for recyclability rather than durability. So our natural binders, they can be dissolved eventually. It is a special process in which the binders can be separated from the, uh, from the textile fibers. And this means that internally we're already repurposing all our offcuts and all our leftovers. 
And what we are aiming for in long term is that we are creating this loop, uh, closed loop in which we are also able to collect back, back all the dead stock from our clients and even the products at their end of their lives. And that way we can repurpose the textile fibers for the making of new biotextile. And this way we can make sure that fibers keep living in products and not in landfills. We are still a startup and there are many things that we still have to figure out along the process, but we, um, we aim to produce the material ourselves by using the existing infrastructure of textile recyclers and textile producers. But on the other hand, we also want to directly collaborate with fashion brands and um, textile uh, centers who have their own textile waste and don't know what to do with it. And we can help them to make tailored solutions for this biotextile that is truly unique to theirs so that they can bring it back to the market over and over again. That is it from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, what a what a range of brilliant, brilliant businesses. And thank you all for presenting so clearly, succinctly getting to the heart of what you do. Um, it's it's fantastic. And I hope uh, everyone here enjoyed that as much as as much as I did. Um, we please do reach out to these folks here. Um, do connect with them on Common Objective uh, and keep the conversations going. We will end this session with a question and answer to, in just a few moments. Um, prior to that, uh, I'm going to quickly show you uh, one or two things on the Common Objective website, which uh, I think uh, will be of interest and uh, will hopefully um, help as you uh, people in this room, whether you're a brand uh, or, or some or into sourcing for some other reason, um, it'll help you and also help suppliers. And it's called Co-Create. It's a new tool is the main thing I'm going to quickly highlight to you. Uh, and this is about setting up a project. So you can launch any project. It could be a style, multiple styles. It could be a fabric requirement. Uh, and it takes about five minutes to do. And once you have uh, gone into the co-create section of the website, you're taken through a very quick flow. Uh, and you're taken down two routes, either apparel and accessories or fabric. Uh, and as I say, it doesn't take long to do. You can you control uh, the for example, the, you control what information is released publicly. Primarily, that's the uh, any uploads you add, like tech packs. Those are not uh, those are not shown uh, unless you until you grant access to a supplier. And you can also hide your business name if you want, or you can display your business name. So this process, as I say, just takes about five minutes. Uh, I won't go through the whole whole thing now, but once you've gone through that then uh, it gets posted on, on uh, the Common Objective website and suppliers can then come along and this is what a supplier will see. These are the current live projects um, and they can uh, request full access, in which case you can then grant them permission to see the files. Uh, and uh, at that point, a supplier can uh, let you know a proposal, can submit a proposal, which is also very easy for suppliers to do. As you can see here, there are some very, very niche things, and there's also some more generic things that people are looking for. So this is a new tool. Uh, it's only been around for a few weeks, uh, and it's uh, yeah, we encourage you to use it. Uh, the other aspects of Common Objective, so we're a, a, a platform, we're a community of 50,000 members, and the three things we do are learn, connect, and create. So that's the create thing I was just showing you. Learn is a whole load of articles and amazing, amazing content. Um, much you know, similar to some of the stuff we've heard today and, and more. Uh, there's webinars, there's articles. There's also co-training, which is a new email training series. Uh, we have several different courses and we're launching new ones all the time. It takes five or six different uh, uh, emails you get over five or six weeks. Uh, with training in those and at the end there's a quiz and then you get a stamp on your profile and also any business profile that you are connected with gets a boost uh, in their search rankings when you do a co-training credit. Very aware of time and I really want to, uh, to hand over to Tamsin so she can run through some of the questions that have been asked. Um, finally before I do that uh, just to mention the different plans on Common Objective 
Uh, there is uh, one plan for individuals. Uh, which gives access to the pro content. So that's all of the articles, including all the paid for articles, pro events. So we've got master classes coming up during this expo. If you're associate or above, then you get pro access to pro events, uh, co-training, which are the training credits, training email co-training credits. Uh, and then we've got three business plans. We've got the pioneer, which uh, you get to use co-create, which is the thing I just showed you, and you get a premium business profile. And then there's team and leader. So I'm going to hand over to Tamsin to touch on those before she takes us through some of the questions that people have been asking. Over to you, Tamsin. Thank you so much. And to all of our speakers today as well, really inspiring. And I just wanted to emphasize that at Co, we're an impact business. So we're, we're, we have uh, B Corp principles enshrined within the business um, constitution. Um, but we also have to survive and our pro members make that possible. Our pro members and our partners, um, our associate network is amazing. Our most engaged and active members are part of the associate network. And it really makes a difference to us. If you're using Co every day, and we know that thousands do, um, why not join our pro uh, uh, community? and help us to do more, because this matters more than ever. Um, sustainability in the fashion industry is urgent. And just a couple of things I wanted to say about the leader package. So um, everybody who you've seen profiled today is part of, uh, is, is a pro business, um, but we're also looking at how can we collaborate with other organizations in the sector? to um, support and further sustainability. And one of the most exciting initiatives I think is out there is the UNFCCC uh, Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action. If we can get some teeth some and some incentives behind this, there have already been 150 brands that have signed up to it, but why should there not be more? There's no reason why every brand shouldn't sign up to the Climate Charter and with the industry on the track it is now set to be over a billion tons above our greenhouse gas warming targets um, within the next 30 years um, we need to be serious about it so we're looking for partners i don't know if andy you might want to navigate to the landing page on co but we already have over 300 resources on there um, a lot of this is done in partnership with other organizations. We have a, a hub in partnership with Textile, um, which has made it possible for us. Um, I don't know if you want to navigate to the Textile hub for us to both share some of the expertise from people like Tiffany and any of the businesses that you've heard from today um, can also join that platform and we can. it makes it possible for our members to source samples through them. Um, so we're looking to build a hub in partnership with our members and several leaders in the space to support businesses across our network to engage with the UN Fashion Industry Charter and to achieve real meaningful change towards the targets that are set by the UN Fashion Charter. One of the challenges with operating sustainably in the fashion industry is there's a, so much information on there and it's often in a very complex format. We want to make it easy and simple and visual. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more about that and having access to it and being part of it, just get in touch. Uh, and we hope that you can be involved um, both as a partner and as, as actors in the space. What's next? Can I pass to you, Andy, to talk about the rest of the program? Uh, yeah, the, the program here, so coming up, um, we've got a masterclass uh, straight after this, or in, in half an hour's time, we've got sustainable materials showcase. So we're going to have uh, more conversation around sustainable materials. We're going to have more businesses showcasing uh, the solutions that they can offer. Uh, it's going to be another really, really good session. And then after that, we have the pro masterclass. Uh, so that's for any pro member. So any of the paying plans, uh, there's one on materials. Uh, and uh, we've got some excellent speakers lined up for that. And then tomorrow is around production. Uh, and then the day after is uh, packaging, components, jewelry, and accessories, as well as a Latin American sourcing showcase. So thank you, uh, particularly to everyone here who has contributed. Uh, it's, it's been really, really great to hear from you all. 
Um, and uh, thank you as well to everyone who has attended and we hope to see you all in the sessions later today and over the next two days. Thanks everyone, hope to see you in the next session.